Okay. Hey, we have some coming. <laughs> we would like to welcome you to this July 8th meeting of the Course County ISD Board of Trustees. All items that will be discussed have been duly posted, and this is a regularly scheduled meeting. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby for audience for guests and follow the instructions on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budget, make policy, and provide oversight. We are not here to manage individual problems. Management is a responsibility of our superintendent. As a board, we believe we must educate every child, give every child the greatest opportunity to learn, and provide a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. And these are our core values. We thank you for your interest in the students of CISD. We have all seven board members here, and so we do have a quorum. First item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Now we are going to have our invocation, and Jeremy Dickerson is going to lead that for us. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to start by praying for those affected by Hurricane Barrel, praying for your hand of protection uh, and comfort over them. I, I, I just pray that, that your will be done and glorified in, in all that is happening. I want to thank you for the season of summer, for the, the ability for our staff and students to rest uh, and, and seek godly rest. I pray that as they uh, continue their summer, they will uh, find, find, find joy in it uh, and comfort in you. I pray that as we go throughout uh, the rest of the summer, that we will continue uh, seeking your wisdom and your will for Course Can ISD. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Do we have any audience for guests? No. Okay. All right. Um, next is the superintendent's report. Tonight we are excited to announce that we have a new head football coach. It's going to be Coach. Allen, oh, not football, oh. baseball. I am so, I mean, basketball. Okay, y'all, I've been on vacation for about 12 days. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Coach Walker, I'm so sorry. Coach Walker, I'm starting over. You are a new head basketball coach. <laughs> We are excited. The group of seniors that he will have this year, he coached them starting from when they were freshmen. So we are excited to have you as our head coach and look forward to all the great things you're going to do with our basketball team. All right. Congratulations, Coach Walker. We're excited for you to continue the great things that have been happening in the basketball program. So, all right. Um, next, we're going to have discussion and action items. Um, First is going to be the change of the board meeting start time. Uh, tonight I'm asking um, that we change our board meeting times from 5 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Um, starting, of course, tonight and moving forward. Um, this will also help accommodate our community to be here for our board meetings. Any discussion? Any? All right. I move that we change the board meeting time to start at 5.30 p.m. We have a motion and a second to change our board meeting times from 5 to 5.30 p.m. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Our new board meeting times will be on 5.30 at 5.30 p.m. All right. Our next action item or discussion item uh, is the first reading of TASB Update 123. In your board book, you will see uh, TASB policy update 123. Um, inside your board book, anything that is in blue is what's being added to our local policies. Anything in red is what's being removed. Um, so you'll have the next few weeks to look this over and we will um, bring back any changes or approval for the next board meeting. So 
So we'll review that at our next. The changes at our next meeting, correct? Yes, okay. So if y'all will review those, if you have any questions, um, we can discuss that at the next meeting. All right. Next is uh, review star scores. Okay, good evening, uh, Ms. Howe, Madam President, and distinguished members of the board. I'm going to um, review this year's STAR scores, but first I want to take just a second to, um, you may or may not have already known, but two years ago in 2023, the TEA did a STAR redesign. So STAR has looked different the last two years than it has previously in the past. Um, some of the biggest changes is writing is now assessed in all grade levels where previously it was only assessed in fourth and seventh grade and that was a standalone test. Now it is um, embedded into all the reading tests starting in third grade all the way through the EOCs. Um, and so with that you're tested with an extended constructed response which would be an informational or an argumentative um, composition. A short constructed response, which is similar to the extended constructed response, it's just not required as much. Maybe it's one or two sentences versus an entire essay. And then they also have revising and editing on that as well. There are new question types on it. So previously the STAR test was just all multiple choice, A, B, C, or D. Now 25% of the test has these new question types, which could be a multi-select, inline answer choices. So they could have to answer by selecting a word within the sentence. They could have two answers to a, to a question. They could drag and drop. They should have a fill in the blank text entry. So, or multi-part questions. So there's lots of different ways for students to show their learning other than guessing on an A, B, C, or D answer choice. Um, the time limits have also increased from four hours to seven hours. So students essentially have an entire school day to answer. And the test is fully online. So I guess I should have started with that. That's the biggest change. But paper options are only available in rare circumstances. So the majority, if not all of our students, are taking that test online. And so here's just an example of one of those. This is a multi-select one. They have to select two correct answers rather than just one. And they do get partial credit for this if they were to select one answer but not both. This is an example of a writing prompt. I believe this was fourth grade. Read the story from Surprise Kick. Based on the information in the story, write a response to the following. Explain how the events in the story caused Cody to change his opinion. Write a well-organized informational composition that uses specific evidence from the story to support your answer. So the biggest thing I wanted to highlight here that's different with the writing is used to, our prompts used to be standalone writing prompts, and now they are expected to write in response to the text that they are reading, um, and more specifically using that text, ev text evidence within their writing. This one was the fourth grade, fourth grade. Okay, so we'll dive into looking at the data for um, CISD. So the table on the left is showing how we compared um, to the region in the state. The state is in red, the region is in green, and we are in blue, and then you can see it broken down by campus below. So CISD was at 55% approaches, and for TEA, for, for Texas, uh, approaches is considered passing, and then you have the meets and masters category two, which are also um, showing further mastery of the skills. So we have 55%. Um, passing compared to the region, which was at 68%, and the state, which was at 69%. The table on the right is comparing the last four years. The blue column is highlighted because that's when the STAR redesign happened, so you can kind of see the shift from when we were taking the traditional test to now to where we're taking the fully online redesigned test. 
The highlighted areas is where we've shown growth from last year to this year. Most notably, um, we saw a huge increase in our third grade math scores at Navarro with a nine point increase. This is the third grade ELAR test. Similarly, the um, table on the left is the same, comparing CISDs at 64%, region at 73%, state at 75%, and then comparing um, the last several years. Again, we showed a um, significant increase of about 22 percentage points in our third grade ELAR scores at Navarro. Um, we also increased by 2% as a district in our third grade ELAR scores. The pie chart that you see in the middle is how our students performed on that extended constructed response. So what you see on the right side with all the blue, which is, takes up about half of the circle, that is the percentage of our students that unfortunately scored a zero on their extended constructed response. And you'll start to see um, some consistencies as we move through Ms. the Ms. Farmer, can you yes. talk to them about how that's graded, those writing? Yes. So um, originally when they came out with this, students can earn 10 points on their extended constructed response. And it used to be from two different graders. So you would get five points from one grader and five points from the other. Well, this TEA came out this last year and said, well, we're gonna use artificial intelligence to grade our extended constructed responses. So originally it was gonna be one human grader, five points, and one AI grader, five points. But then they came out and said, well, 75% of them are gonna be graded by AI, 25 will be graded by the, by the humans, and we'll just have the, the AI flag when they're not really sure and we'll get a human grader to grade it. So um, you're kind of fighting a weird battle there because you're, you're, you're a human, but you have a computer grading you. So we take that with a grain of salt. We have been reviewing the writing for all the grade levels, and we have seen some consistencies and some inconsistencies, but it's just trying to figure out the game. Um, we have seen that most of the kids that got a zero, they might have wrote beautiful compositions, but at the end of the day, they didn't respond to the prompt, and that's why they scored a zero or maybe they scored a zero because they wrote one sentence. So it's just kind of finding, finding where our gaps are and, and getting them adjusted that way. Okay, fourth grade math, 56% passed for CISD, 65 for the region and 68 for the state. Um, this table on the right looks a little bit different just because we did have a significant drop in our fourth grade math scores And so I just wanted to see how the rest of the state and the region compared the region also had a significant drop So that tells us a lot too. Um, is it our teaching? Is it the test? It's just questions for us to ask and for us to dig into a little bit more And of course you have these numbers in front of you if you need me to slow down at any time. Just let me know Fourth grade ELAR, again, the pie chart shows about the same, about 50% of our students scoring a zero on that ECR. 67% of our students passed compared to 80 and 82% in the region and the state. And then you can see the comparison from year to year. On the right, we scored about 70% passing last year. We're at 64% this year. Fifth grade math and science. Fifth grade math is um, holding strong with the region and the state with about 70%, 73% in the region, 76% in the state, um, staying consistent in the low 70s range from last year to this year. Fifth grade um, science, we're about 46% passing when the region's 58 and the state is 87% passing. We did see a little bit of a drop in science as well. Fifth grade ELAR, again, the pie chart shows those ECRs were a little bit over 50%. Um, zeros on our ECRs there, 68% of them are passing, 77% from the region and 78% from the state. We're within about a 4% range um, this year than we were last year. Sixth grade math and sixth grade ELAR, 63% <clears throat> for CISD, 68% for the region, 69% for the state. Did see a little bit of a drop in sixth grade math. Sixth grade ELAR, 66% this year, 74 for the region, 75 for the state. Again, same, same consistencies with that pie chart. We're still seeing the same percentage of students scoring a zero on those ECRs. Um, and this next slide was just a repeat of what we just talked about. So moving forward, what we're doing to address that. So we do recognize that we have a huge writing gap in CISD with numbers like that. So we have, ad we have adopted the Jane Schaefer Writing Program that we will be um, implementing kindergarten through 12th this next year. And it's gonna hopefully help us align what we're doing with our writing all the way from the foundational level and help support all the way up through those grades that are having to test. So. Um, we're really excited about that and we're hoping that we see a difference with that just in the same consistency, the same verbiage being used and it's also aligned to what STARS is expecting of us. 
Um, we have received a grant from the state for implementing research-based instructional strategies and high-quality instructional materials. So we've got some committees and planning going on that. Hopefully in the spring, we'll be into the implementation phase of it. We've started um, being very intentional about our instructional coaching plan and putting the, the high needs areas with the most instructional coaches. We are trying to adjust, where well, we are adjusting um, how we do our assessing in the district to align with STAR and to make sure that we're being intentional with it and helping our, our teachers with that data-driven instruction so that we can get ahead of the data and we're not waiting till STAR to realize that we have an issue. Um, all the administrators were trained on PLCs back in June, so they will also be helpful in having those data conversations and having those instructional conversations as well. Um, and we're also working on aligning our phonics instruction in K through two to help build some of that foundation. Um, Dr. Harl is going to present the um, middle school and high school, but she is at a conference this week. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over the scores for the middle school and the high school as well. Um, this is all subjects right here for the middle school. Uh, CMS altogether was 58% approaches, 30% meets, and 10% masters. You can see on the spreadsheet there how they've compared to, from the years before. Breaking it down by subject, 56% approaches, 32% meets, oh, this, sorry, this is seventh grade ELAR, um, 56 approaches, 32% meets, 12% masters. 61, eighth grade ELAR, 61% got approaches, 22% meets, 3% masters. Seventh grade math, there were 48% approaches, 23% meets, and 5% masters. Again, if you need me to slow down, if you have any questions about any of these specifically. Eighth grade math was at 61% approaches, 22% meets, and 3% masters. Um, yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, history, we were at 36% approaches, 11% meets, and 4% masters. Eighth grade science, 57% 57 appro 57 approaches, 31% meets, and 11% masters. Um, this next slide here shows the breakdown of comparing it across the region and the state. It says, of course, can HS, but that's supposed to say, I'm certain it's supposed to say MS. Um, you can see that for seventh grade ELAR, we are at 56%. The region was at 71%. The state was at 72. For eighth grade, we were at 66. The region was at 79. The state was at 78. In most cases, the region and the state are very close. Um, for seventh grade math, we were at 48%. The region and the state are not far off at 52 and 53%. Eighth grade math, we're at 61%. Again, not far off from the region and the state at 66 and 60%. Eighth grade history, we're at 37%, region of state 53 and 58, and then eighth grade science is at 58%, and the region of state is at 66 and 68. So we'll move on and talk about the high school. For all subjects, the whole high school was at 74% approaches, 41% 41 41 meets, and 10% masters. English one and English two were at 61% approaches, 39% meets, and 6% masters. And you can see the comparison from the previous years as well. Algebra 1, 68% were at approaches, were 21% at meets and 7% masters. Biology is at 58%, 32% uh, meets, 11% masters. U.S. History was at 96%, with 64% meets and 29% masters. And then a breakdown comparing um, the high school scores to the region and the state. We've got English 1 at 54%, where the region was at 69 and 67%. We've got English 2 at 63%, where the region 12 and the state was at 76 and 75. Algebra 1 was at 68%, the region was at 72 and 79. U.S. History was at 96%. We beat the state, who was at 95%. Um, and the biology, biology is at 58%, where the region in the state was at 66 and 62%. And that is all of the STAR scores. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so since the state is using AI, mm -hmm. do we like it or not? Right. <laughs> Are we 
that conversation has come up. We actually just talked about that today. We were playing around with some different AI things. Um, took some of our responses from our kids and put them into our own like chat GPT and things like that just to see what we would come up with to see if there were some consistencies. But yeah, we are, that is something that we're looking at. As, as a tool, just as, as a compare, it's not to replace the teacher grading it because at the end of the day, they still need to know how, yeah. But we gotta play the game, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do we think that because they're, um, the grading is so skewed or kids are scoring zeros, do we think that maybe they're going to possibly rethink the decision of using AI? They haven't or said anything at this time. They just, they, at first the conversation was, well, we're gonna kind of use AI, AI, and then it moved to, well, we're gonna really use AI. So maybe if they see that most students didn't perform well with the AI, if they didn't, but again, we did look at a lot of um, the writing samples of what students turned in. And I could see where some of it was justified and I could also see a lot of inconsistencies in some of it as well. We just need to dig into it a little more to be for sure. I would like to see, I would like to see the, I know that there is a rubric, but I would like to see like a breakdown of why, the justification I guess for why the AI chose specific um, ratings for specific pieces. That would be nice to see. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next um, is the cell phone policy proposal. All right, Ms. Howe, Madam President, uh, members of the board, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, we were asked by Ms. Howe to put some, a sample policy option together to, that addresses cell phones. Um, the problem in mind being that it was effect, it's affecting instruction, uh, in particular on the secondary campuses. So I teamed up with Mr. Doring uh, and Mr. Johnson and uh, our campus principals and put some ideas together. It's a hot topic right now, so there's plenty of stuff floating around uh, out there um, about it. Um, and we condensed this, and there, I know there's a, it didn't come up here, but I know there's a copy of it in board book of the, uh, of the sample policy we put together. Has everybody had a chance to, to take a peek at that? Okay. Uh, if, you, if you'll let me, I'd just like to take you kind of through our conversation and what led us uh, to this version, and then we'll certainly be open to suggestion uh, over how we move forward with it or how we don't move forward with it. Um, getting it out of the classroom obviously is the, the, the priority. Uh, we did not think collectively as a group with the principals that uh, our EC through six students need a cell phone during the day in any form or any capacity whatsoever. Um, they're young. They, they're, there are many parents, we believe, that will want it in their possession. Uh, and that's, I, I can understand that in terms of having it in a backpack uh, for safety and security purposes on the, on the parent end. Uh, that being said, we, we cannot find a, a correlation that needed it to be in their hand from the time school started to the time school was over in the afternoon, uh, in our opinions, uh, both as parents in the district and professionally. Uh, grades seven through eight f feel the exact same way about it during instructional time. However, uh, the thought process and, and the conversation kicked up that cell phones are a part of the world at the moment. Uh, everybody in this room has got one on them. I bet everybody in this room has checked it once, at least since they've been in the room. Uh, it's typical, it, do, it does drive things. They do need to learn how to be responsible with them uh, and how to not be responsible with them. Uh, at the seventh and eighth grade level, I feel like it's a lot, a lot to ask of them to, to, uh, to, to take care of their business with them during the day. So the policy that we came up with was that uh, before and after school and then during designated, designated lunch periods being the only time that they get a, I guess you might call it a reprieve, a time to, to, to check in with whatever that means, parents, uh, email for a lot of our students, and for it to be their device during that 30 minute lunchtime, we felt like that was appropriate, and for it not to be out at all, uh, other than in their bag or pocket during the remainder of the school day. Moving on to high school, 
Felt like if we're going to do right, we teach them how to be responsible, and it's a continuation of what, what they progressed to at the middle school. Uh, and the 45-minute class periods, no way, form, or fashion should they have their cell phones out at all, uh, and then allow them to have them out during the passing periods and at lunch at the high school level only, 9 through 12. Um, I think that our kids, without us doing anything crazy and using strong language like the word ban, uh, or looking at putting uh, something in place like the yonder pouches. I, I think that before we do anything like that, we ask our kids to adhere to this policy. I do. I think they will. I think they'll do what we ask them to do. Uh, I think they've done that in classrooms that the teachers have asked them and demanded it. There's been no holistic policy that teachers could rely on to support them in not allowing those phones in the classrooms. Um, and in moving forward with something like this, we can enforce it from the students, but we can also hold our teachers accountable for not allowing uh, cell phones in those classrooms during instructional time too. And and I really think that I really think that we can do this without doing anything more drastic than this. There has to be consequences when you put something in place uh, for students that do violate policy. One thought from the principals was that uh, you know we don't we don't want to look up and up and have crazy numbers in terms of. Uh, behavior referrals, uh, in school or out of school placements due to a policy that we're putting in place, but we do, they do need to, need to feel it. If it's going to be something that, that, we, that we do and we demand, then there's got to be accountability. So as you can see here, it's as simple as a first and second offense violation. On the first offense of having a cell phone out at an inappropriate time during the school day, it is taken from the student, locked up in the office and you had to have your parent come with you at the end of the school day to get it back at no charge. After the first policy, uh, the second, I'm sorry, the first offense, the second offense is the exact same thing at, uh, as well as a $10 charge to get that phone back. And then moving to the third and, and so on and so forth, it's $10 every time it happens. I feel, like, I feel like that's the thing to do. You have board policy in place right now that supports that, that, that never changed. From the original policy, the only thing that we did was add the BYOD, bring your own device uh, initiative that came in, which at the time was a thing to do as well. Uh, now it is not. We have devices for them. That's, in my mind, that's what the difference is now. Um, your principals are all on board with, with, with this. They like it. Uh, we wanted to see what you think. Questions, comments? I think what brought this about for us is that we attended uh, the Amazing Shake interviews back in the spring and there were several, several of us in attendance um, and Kamar got to ask students questions and one was related to cell phone use in schools. So Kamar, if you want to like share some of the responses that got your attention regarding the cell phone and what the students said to us. It was so long ago, I've been asleep a few times. <laughs> but no, a lot of those kids said that they felt that it was a distraction. Um, there were so many things that they was able to do during periods as far as set up the meetups and fights in the, in the bathroom, um, you know, talk down about someone, Billy, all these different things that it was allowing them to do, as well as um, taking the focus off doing their work where they had to really you know, when we, when we was in school, we had to use pen and paper. Mm -hmm. Now they can just type in a word on their phone and boom, they're going to answer and then they're done, you know. So, you know, you take, you take it took a lot of the uh, focus away from being in class, paying attention to the teachers. Um, and I think that this is a good idea because it will, um, it'll, it'll help the teachers to be able to kind of take control more of, of the classroom, um, which, is, which is slipping away. Um, so. It, it is a lot, and it was it was it was you know kind of eye opening to hear, you know some of those kids tell you why they think that they should ban, because that was the question, mm -hmm. you know should we ban? They're trying to pass a law to ban the um, cell phones, and what what should we do? Do you think it's a good idea? And if we asked 50 of them, 48 of them said yes, you should ban it, um, because you know they, they of course they understood the importance of. Uh, being able to reach out to your parents or something like that if something happened. But in the classroom, it was like, we're all for it not being in the classroom. 
and I think it's, it'll be a good relief. So um, I really hope that they're taking take this into consideration. That it, because uh, um, I, I believe it'll work. I agree. Kathy, were you you were there as well? I was. And what I guess what feedback did you hear from the kids? Uh, the, or stood out to you? The biggest thing was a distraction, and I was shocked more um, more so about how many kids voluntarily told us this. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, I mean, it wasn't um, that they were hiding the fact that they were distractions. They were saying cell phones are a distraction in class, period. And that was a big thing is um, that they, they yeah. openly told us that. And they openly told us that students use their cell phones to cheat on tests. Mm -hmm. And so if our core values are to protect our children and make sure they have a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically, the cell phone is not it's not a tool that is productive anymore. Com when we originally brought it in back to, you know, bring your own device that was being used to help in class and use it, you know, as a, a tool. Now we have one-on-one. -on -one. We all have a computer. So we don't need that as part of helping teach our kids. Um, because now, it's, like I said, it's used for bullying and cheating and uh, all the emotional and mental health issues that a lot of our kids are experiencing during the day at school because somebody's posted something on social media. So uh, I'm a big proponent of, of putting some uh, a policy in place. I know parents think that they need to be able to access their child 24-7. I agree with that. But now that we do have computers, they have an email address. If they're in seventh, eighth high school, they can email them throughout the day. They ought to be able to access that and respond via email, which is a skill they've got to learn anyway when you, you know, move into the workforce. Um, and then when you're in the workforce, you're not allowed to be on this 24-7. You have to focus on your job, and this is a distraction as an employee. So um, I think that's definitely something that we need to consider. And, you know, like I said, I know parents will, will have a heartburn with it, but we had heartburn with hoodies, and look where we are now. I mean, we, we, we made it over the hump, and our kids are better for it. So um, I think if we're, going to, if we're going to take care of our kids and we, we see our star scores, obviously we need to take, care, take away any distraction that could possibly be there um, to help our teachers and our, and our staff do the best they can do in educating them. So any other comments? Um, I'm just curious, are we just implementing this policy? Are we getting, um, what was that pouch that they can put right. their no, cell phones no, in? No, no, just no pouch. Honestly, um, like I said, before we did a, a lot of research on it, I, I, I think that that's, uh, I think that's a stronger stance than what we have to take because I do think our kids will do what we ask them to do as long as we hold our teachers accountable for holding the kids accountable during instruction time. Uh, it's pretty expensive, and to be honest with you, well, we had we had uh, IT look at it. There, there are hacks all over the internet for those things. It, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't see it being a long-lasting way, way to uh, prevent this. Yeah, my only concern is I know um, that it was something that had been implemented in the past, and it does not seem uh, that has been very successful in these guidelines, because these guidelines are familiar. Um, I think when Prez was in a younger grade, um, right. this was first implemented a while back. On and charging? So, huh? On charging for, for Yes, phones. this was something that I'm familiar with as a parent um, since Prez was, I think, maybe in Collins, so I don't, years back. Um, so I'm just concerned if this was something that was in place prior, is that correct? Or was that just by campus? It was, but it, it the reason it was taken away was because of the implementation of BYOD. Okay, so it was something that was taken yeah, away prior. It, it was it was uh, it was to try to create one to one okay. on, on a uh, on, on a scale that we didn't have to support financially on every single student by allowing them to bring their own devices, and then it stopped the policing of cell phones uh, on campus essentially. Thank you. What about the earbuds? Um, is that something we're gonna we right. could also so, so board policy uh, currently supports any any form of a messaging device so um, 
in my opinion, when we move forward with it, we've got to get more specific than, than this than this generic flyer that we put together. But I don't think that they can have the watches, uh, the AirPods, in, anything that's got connectivity options with that cell phone and a communication slash messaging device uh, in their possession. I don't think they need it. Like they need our devices or none for that 45 minute instructional period, mainly at the high school. Any other questions or? Yeah. Watches are a good. I mean, that was my next question. It's going to be the watches because everything can go through the watch sure, if that exactly. cell phone is is in there or if it's connected to the internet. Um, yes, sir. So I think I think yeah, this. And then there'll be something else uh, invented next yeah. year that will yeah. um, continue. Will our firewall? Will our firewall catch Bing via email and things of that nature? Because that's that's going to be the next thing, right? It's going to go through the emails, and so. But since it's going to be on our server, we should be able to catch it, right? Right. We also got a bunch of folks that's looking for those type of keywords that would be done by the chief students, so that we have some of them down here. That's good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is the preliminary budget review. Uh, Mrs. Howe, Madam President, board members, thank you. Uh, I'm here to present the preliminary budget for next fiscal year, which begins on September 1st. So uh, first page. Projected revenue, these are not final numbers, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to those in, over the next uh, three to four weeks, hopefully, uh, some better projections of revenue. But you're looking at a $62,109,589 for our revenue uh, this next school year. The following pages breaks that down. A couple of things to note, we had the lower SHARs uh, which is our reimbursement for Medicaid services, essentially Medicaid services from the federal government. Uh, Texas is being penalized. Nothing we did wrong, but basically we're, we're losing about four to $500,000 in revenue just from SHARs, okay? Uh, interest rates are still high. Um, we, we don't know how they'll look next year. Uh, but we will take a conservative route on projecting for that as well. After that, you have a spreadsheet. This is what the region uses and, and sends out to us, and we use it for our data entry to project ADA. So for 24-25, we are using a 5,600 number. What that is is we're projecting, on average, 5,600 kids will show up to school each day. That's how we get funded. That turns out to be about a 92.5 attendance rate, which for this past school year, we're a little bit lower than that, okay? But it's in the ballpark. So on the following page, you will see some different projections with different attendance rate. So in the middle, you have an attendance rate of 93%, which is 5,627 uh, kids showing up to school. We'll increase our funding $148,000. You can see below that for 93 and a half, there's another uh, that would increase 323. On the following page, 94% and 95%. 95%, 841,266 dollars added to the budget. That is pre-COVID numbers. That those attendance rates. Uh, we haven't we haven't averaged that since pre-COVID. Um, we are kind of stuck in the 92s, 93s. Uh, so. I have a question. Last year, um, for this previous school year, what was we were our enrollment was over six thousand, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. So we have to staff, we have to plan for over six thousand students, but we're only getting paid for fifty six hundred students. Correct. 
Correct. We're, we're one of the unlucky states that funds by attendance and not by enrollment. So I have friends that are teachers in other states, and this is a foreign idea. Uh, if there's 22 kids in their classroom, that's what they, they, they get funded to, to uh, plan for. And so, yes, funding by enrollment would be a big help and makes a lot more sense. For our, for our staff. So and that's basically 400 students as a school. Yeah. So we're not yeah. receiving that that income. Mm -hmm. Basically, for elementary school. school. For an elementary school. school. Yeah. 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 And it was last updated in 2019. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. We're going to hit on that Thank here you. in just a second. Um, we are addressing uh, the attendance as well. Um, Dr. Bolware here um, has last year uh, talked with a company and um, they do a lot of the, the, the kind of behind the scenes work about sending out letters to parents, making contact. Um, and we've seen, we know some other districts, I believe it's, is it Midlothian? There's, there's a district near us that uses it that has seen some, a bunch of success and one up in the DFW area. So. We look forward to that. Um, our APs and principals are, are, are extremely busy doing other things uh, and sending out thousands of truancy letters uh, because the, the policy behind it can be pretty tedious for one person to be doing every three to, to six weeks. So, and the amount that it will cost and the amount that we could receive in attendance, I mean, it's, it's an easy, I guess you could say profit. Okay. All right. Following page projected expenses, $64,654,772. Our expenses have gone up. Um, one area, PCAT, our property insurance. I mean, just over a few years, we're almost up over a million dollars. We have not got our final number, but we did receive another higher percentage that it could go up for this next year. Um, so you're talking, we've gone from 300 some thousand just a few years ago to almost 1.2, could be higher next year. And remember this is based, and we'll, we'll talk about it more, but this is based on the same funding formula from 2019. As we're planning for payroll next year, we're using the $399, that's just an F FYI, uh, as we're planning. It is now 446 uh, per employee. Uh, we will get into that in some numbers near the end of this presentation. The other parts of the budget, such as contracted services, supplies, travel, right, our object codes from 6,200 through 6,600, we have not touched those. We have not raised those. Those are the same. So from, uh, from this current fiscal year to next year. Uh, we did note a little bit higher uh, increase in our interest rates for our, uh, our uh, investment funds. Uh, following page, we talked again, reduced SHARs, and once again, the ADA uh, of 5,600, which is about 92.5%. That's how next year's budget is built, okay? So not many changes from this past year's uh, payroll, obviously has its adjustments with the step raise. Um, and if we, whatever we decide with health, health insurance. All right. The next page is our current total deficit, if adopted as is, $2,545,183. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing this across the state. We rely on a formula from 2019 that's pre-COVID, pre-inflation. We have reasonable salaries here. We have reasonable steps. And the formula can't support that. And it hasn't supported the, the, the increases in uh, insurance. Um, you're, you're, you see it in the news every day. So um, we're doing our best here. Uh, but this is what's happening right now. This is where we're at at the moment. Um, I'll continue to update you as we get new numbers. If you go to the next page, here's the history of our general fund balance. Right now we have about 22 million. 
uh, calculated it today is about 130 days, is that what we said? It's about 130 days of expenses, uh, so which is very good. You can see the history of it. Um, we're up over the last few years. Final page. Uh, this is just to, to, to look at. Uh, so we contribute $399 to our staff members who choose the health insurance. It's gone up to 446 this year. At the top, you see some other schools and what they contribute. Again, we're at 399, Ennis 325, Mildred 325, Waxahachie 245. So we kind of stand above them. What is required by the state? What are we required to pay? 225. Yeah. So we're paying well above that. And yes. we, right now, until the increase goes into effect, we're paying 100% right. of the insurance for all of our employees that right. take it. Okay. Right. So these are just, remember, informational. This is not something we're talking about. But just to understand, uh, you know, if we were to just pay 225, uh, it would decrease the budget by 1.4 million, okay? If you go on the way other extreme, if we bring it up to the 446, it would hit our budget uh, by 380,000, okay? Um, you can see some of the other adjustments there. If we took it down to 375, we would save $194,000. Any questions on those numbers? John, I have, I have a comment. Sure. And, and this is for everybody to know. You know. If you look at that general fund balance sheet, you know, in 2019 we had 18 million and we dropped to 15 million. If y'all, and, and this is for the new board members as well, that year we had to pay for those air conditioners. We had air conditioners, I forgot which school it was. Um, do you remember, Kathy? Yeah. But it was air conditioners at some school um, that was passed um, at the beginning of 19, um, and we had to pay for that out of fund balance. But after that, as you can see, we have added to fund balance every single year, and we only have to keep 90 days by law, and we're at 130. So we've really tried hard to put money back to fund balance. But I just want people to remember, this gets stopped at Austin, folks. And I went personally and talked to Cody Harris. And all of this died because of vouchers. And the funding is real. The funding has not changed since 2019. So I just want to make sure if people are watching, they need to know we're working on 2019 numbers. And I don't think anybody wants to work on 2019 numbers for their own personal budget. And that's what we're having to do. Yeah. So just so if people, people want to know, that's be safe for a rainy day. And guess what? It's raining. Yeah. And we, we have a budget uh, finance committee that we have put together. And we've been meeting over the last few months uh, to see where we can uh, reduce costs, save money, you know, what what can we do? Um, because obviously we don't want to adopt a deficit budget. I mean, that is definitely not our goal, um, but we're in a situation where we, you know, that, that looks like what is gonna have to happen if the state doesn't come through with additional funding for us. So, um, I want everybody to know that we are working. All right, I'm going to close my ring. Um, I want everybody to know that we are being very diligent and looking at everything, um, you know, every expense we can to try and cut costs, save money, uh, but yet take care of our employees and, and all the things that we need to in our campuses. So. And our newest building is built in the 90s. That's our newest building is mm -hmm. the middle. Oh, middle school. Besides that, the, the, the next closest building was built in the 90s. Yeah. I was going to so. say that, too, that we think of Navarro, maybe the field house, things that feel new. 
they're they're over 25 years old now. Right. So, so we're fighting we're aging buildings, maintenance, maintenance on the, the facilities and things like that, and that is a huge expense. And so, um, you know, those those money's not just growing from the trees like people think that we just have money laying around. We don't. Um, so we are being very diligent about that, and um, like I said, trying to cut costs and still take care of what we got to take care of to educate our kids. So. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are going to move into closed session um, as permitted by Texas Governance Code Section 55101. Thank you. <laughs>